Welcome to the Alfalfa Podcast. We are four radically moderate entrepreneur and investor friends swimming in the messy gray ocean, seeking alfalfa in money and life. And today we're talking about dollar sign coin, Coinbase. And what we want to uh, really parse through is, I think, a very profound and important question for all crypto investors out there. And the question is, is Coinbase stock actually the best exposure to crypto? And this is something that... Um, some of the amigos here have been thinking about a lot. I have some questions for sure. I'm an owner of Dollar Sign Coin, and uh, I think this is going to make a very great discussion. It's been acting like a fucking crypto token lately, so um, this is going to make for an interesting discussion, boys. It's going to be a good one. Hmm. I'm a no coiner right now. No Wait, dollar sign. No coiner. dollar sign coiner. Oh, okay. <laughs> I own the bonds. I own the bonds. I took that as how you used to say I'm a no coiner oh, back for, in the day. For so long, I was like a, yeah. a no, traditional no coiner. Yeah, you enjoyed that. Place. Now I'm a I'm a coin enjoyer, <laughs> and uh, soon, at some point, soon I will be a dollar sign coin enjoyer, but not yet. But you're not ready to back up the truck yet. No, I don't think I am. But let's let's. Yeah, let's park dig it. in later. Yeah, keep it in the pants. Yeah. So let's do a little macro update, a little off off around, and then dig right into the good stuff. So what do you guys got for macro this week? Hmm. For macro? For oh, market. Oh. Excuse me, market updates. Oh, you want to talk about or markets macro. first? Yeah. Do markets yeah. first? Markets, oh. alfalfa, Coinbase. Oh, that's confusing. I thought we did it the other way around. What? That's okay. okay. That's okay. I'll, do it the I'll, other way around. I'll humor you today. Do it that's the other fine. way around. I'm, 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 I'm in it, dude. I got baby brain right now. <laughs> We got daddy brain. <laughs> uh, I don't know, honestly. These are confusing times in markets. I mean, we've talked a lot about how this is going to be a choppy year that probably drives everybody freaking bananas. And so far, I think it's been that way. Um, crypto is super confusing right now. I don't know how, how in the market are you guys? I've been uh, selling off my ARB tokens over time. Yeah. That's about as in market. And I still have my like ADA Bitcoin spread trade going. So I keep an eye on that. So you're not like, day. you don't have a lot of Delta. No. It's good. That sounds relaxing. Yeah. yeah it's, nice. it's, it's, it's weird. Like um, ETH looks terrible. Bitcoin looks awesome. But there's like some alts that look super awesome. And then there's other alts that look terrible. And I cannot for the life of me tell if we're just like about to completely shit the bed or do a little scam pumpy. Or um, melt, yeah. It seems like a melt is also possible. Yeah, I mean, I've been positioning for a for a for a nuke, I guess, because I've been selling off all the spot I bought and like the fourteens and and like building some short positions. And I, I don't know, it does look very distribution y to me and we're in very high time frame resistance on Bitcoin um, and kind of on ETH as well. And I don't know, it just feels weird out there. I, I, I've never been this confused before, to be honest. So I don't know if you guys have any insights. No, to help I just me. feel so much better hearing <laughs> all of this. Um, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> yeah. Speak on behalf yeah. of most of the Alfalfa community. Thank you. Yes. Oh, wise one. I don't have great. Um, I don't have a great edge for you right now. I'm sorry. I, I'll, I'll give it to you. Sometimes straight. that's I'm, the best edge. So yeah. Sometimes I, that's the best. Route. I took this moment and I I took a few days off of of trading entirely and it felt very good. I, I was focused mm. on SDSU on literally sports. I was focused <laughs> on sports. So Hell much. yeah. So that sounds great. SDSU made it to the final four. I'm going to Houston on Friday. I'm Damn. going to see our our beloved Aztecs compete. In a game of basketball. Who's your guy, like, on the court? Oh, I don't really think that we even have, like, any guy. Like, this is, like, a unique team. We mm. have, like, nine mediocre players or, like, above-average players that, like, yeah. can all play. It's not like a there's it's not like a star-driven yeah. team. It's, it's not cool. a Kawhi team like that we yeah. have. Yeah. Yeah, so I never thought we would actually go far. In my bracket, I even had us losing uh, probably in the Sweet 16 or something. So it's a surprise. I... You know, they've been building this program for a long time. You know, Aztec basketball has been competitive for a decade, you know, even since we were going there. Mm -hmm. So I always thought we'd make it to the Final Four. I didn't think it would be this moment. But I took some days off trading, and I'm very excited to be going to Houston for the first time. That's big, man. Yeah. Mm. I've been looking at the 10-year, um, two-year inversion. Like, we're obviously uninverting. And I think Jeffrey Gunlock mentioned this, that, like, when... These yield curves uninvert. That's typically bad, right? Bad, bad. 
usually means a recession is typically months. And obviously, you don't know when the recession starts until you're well into it and they backdate the start of the recession. So he's been kind of saying he thinks it's within three months-ish is kind of when the when we look back, when the start date will be. So I don't know. I, I think it's just kind of like a wait and see moment to see if credit is tightening like we talked about um, in, in the previous episode. Are, are, are these banks lending and, and what happens to unemployment? And we'll see. I mean, I'm kind of curious to just, I, I, I think there's going to be a recession and I'm very curious to see how crypto reacts during it. But I, I'd imagine you don't really want to be uh, not good. full bags during a deflationary quadrant. We've never experienced that before. We haven't, but so. we're going to learn today. That'll be fun. Yeah. It's kind of like, uh, I, I was, I was looking at some, uh, some slides today and I saw the, uh, we talk about liquidity a lot, right. And how the, the, the treasury has basically been draining the account ahead of the debt ceiling debacle, which has injected a lot of cash into the market, which has been good for risk assets. And, it seems that it's like almost drained at the moment. It's like 180 bill left. We got the debt ceiling thing coming up this summer. Everybody's gotten very high off the uh, BTFP program because the balance sheet went up. But I feel like that's temporary. I don't know. I have like all this anxiety because like I feel like I kind of called the top and it feels toppy to me. But also like ev- a lot of people who I respect are like pretty bullish and. I don't know. I'm just I'm just stressed. Maybe I just need a therapy session. I mean, the way that balance sheet moved <laughs> off the BTFP makes me nervous to short anything. Like even if you're even if you're sort of biased on the downside, it just feels like a scary time. Maybe yeah. you need to go to Houston. Maybe, maybe. I I, I do think I need to take. I do also, think doesn't I need everything break. tank when you travel? That's oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I need to go somewhere. I need to get on a plane tomorrow because I have all these uh, March uh, puts. <laughs> you need to get in the money. <laughs> yeah, Darabit uh, banned Canadians. And as you guys know, I'm an honorary Canadian. Um, mm, damn. Yes, so no, I'm Swiss. I'm my, Swiss as hell. <laughs> my, my account is reduce only, so I can't roll any of my positions oh, over. Oh, shit. So, like, all my hedges expire on Friday. So, I'm like, ah, what do I do? Well, um, we had a nice little uh, pump today. Well, oh, you're long yeah. puts. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Vol down. <laughs> sorry, dude. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, buddy. Um, anyway, yeah, good times. Good times. Well, hopefully we get a little more clarity in the coming weeks. Indeed. So who's got some alfalfa? This, I got something to play with. Yeah. yeah, yeah, give me. All right, so I just want to give a little, maybe we could talk a full episode of this at some point, but I wanted to talk about uh, as a business owner and entrepreneur, like what's a good entity setup? Just the, oh, the bare bones Nikki basics. Boy, this wow. is good. Okay. Yeah. So we won't get into too much, but there's mainly two purposes for, um, or you could say you could say three purposes. Um, one is risk mitigation. Second is tax mitigation, and then third is if something happens to you, does everything pass on to the people you want it to pass on to quickly and easily for them? So um, I'll take an example. If I if I own business A. Most people own it as an individual, right? You own your individual shares. Say that you own 50% of a company, you own it individually. I like to put a holding company in between there. And in business A, let's say you have a business partner and there's benefits of being an owner. You can write off expenses that might have occurred in your day-to-day life that are actually real business expenses that you can write off and decrease your taxable income. But sometimes it gets a little messy between you and your business partner. Well, I wrote off... $3,000 of expenses this month and you wrote off a thousand and how do you square that up? And it it sometimes gets a little messy. Um, There may be expenses that your other business partner doesn't agree that you should write off. So when you add an extra layer, you have a holding company, own your shares in that company. Well, if there's businesses you can't write off in that business, you could write off in the holding company, essentially like the management company of, of your ownership in that. It also provides an extra layer of risk mitigation. So... If for some reason they pierce the corporate veil between your ownership of company A, well, they have to pierce the corporate veil of you and your holding company. We don't need to get into like what piercing the corporate veil means. And this is specifically a partnership, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good point. So we're talking about non C corp businesses. This is a partnership LLC. Yeah. These are taxed as an LLC. Pass through entities for tax purposes. Cool. 
So where the gains and losses and the pass holding through. company is just another LLC that you have set up for yourself. Mm-hmm. This is uh, cool for me because I have one yeah. of these. Right, yeah, an LLC good. that owns your Shares, percentages your of the ownership. LLC, not you as the individual. Yeah, I think this is important. Um, so that's that's one. Yep. Okay, and I have two holding companies. I have mm. one for the businesses I'm active in. I'm mm. building that business. I'm essentially an employee of that business also. Mm-hmm. And then I have others where I'm, I have no involvement in the business. Maybe it was like an investment or maybe I was an advisor. I invested in it. That's a passive. And the reason I do that is it keeps it easy in my head um, uh, for taxes. So there's an additional tax called a net investment income tax. I think it started when Obamacare launched. They launched a up to 3.8% additional tax on your federal income and your state income tax uh, if you have a passive investment. And oh, thanks, Obama. <laughs> yeah. So you want to make thanks, sure if you're Obama. active in your business and you're working on it that it's not marked passive because that, that one check mark can cost you a lot of money. Interesting. So, so one reason is I just, in my head, it's nice to know, okay, for my accountant, these businesses are passive. These are active. Also, I don't really want to lump all these businesses. Uh, I don't want to lump the risk of businesses I'm not managing myself with businesses I am managing. So if there's, an, there's operators managing those businesses and they make a mistake or take risks that I'm not acceptable with, it's not going to impact you know, everything else. Certainly not going to impact me personally, but it's not going to impact the other, mm. you know, other uh, things in the, in the uh, active holding company. And then the third thing I mentioned, which is passing things on, I think everyone should set up a trust. Um, there's no risk mitigation in a trust. There's no tax benefits of having a trust. A trust simply just holds your assets. It refers to your revocable trust document that you can say, these are the people who are going to make the decisions when I pass on, and this is who that goes to. It's a logic tree. Um, and for the, your beneficiaries, it keeps it easy because otherwise it has to go to court a court probate. date, probate, a court date has to get assigned. If there's no trust. If there's no trust, they might have to actually defend. What if someone else says, well, you know, he was my business partner. He didn't really do much. So I, I should deserve the economic interest of those shares. This just keeps it easy. And as, as soon as they have the death certificate, the, the person, the executor of the trust can take ownership of it, you know, and just yeah. give money to the beneficiary within a week, typically. So anyway, that's like a brief overview of, you know, the like 80-20 of setting up entities and, and how to use them and uh, and also how to like nice. so in, mitigate in, risk and, and make sure, you know, people that you want to pass on stuff to get it quickly. Yeah. In, in what case then, um, well, a couple questions. One, um, do you have alfalfa under the uh, passive bucket or the... <laughs> it's actually under the active bucket. Ah, yeah. this yeah. is quite active. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sure question. No, but do you, um, in what situation do you uh, look at C corporations? As you, as you know, like we yeah. deal with one, but I'm curious if you can just talk about that one too. So um, I have two C corp investments and uh, the holding company LLC owns the shares of those C corp, but mm-hmm. there's no real tax benefit because a C corp, there's, there's double taxation, right? The, the entity gets taxed on the profits. And then when you pay a shareholder, that shareholder has to pay taxes on it. Um, yeah, that there's, there's not really much to do with the C corp. In fact, yeah. I kind of like them because the taxes are just straightforward. Right. There's no K one you get. It's just like, if you didn't distribute any money from the C corp, a couple pages you file nice and easy. I want to do like a more thorough breakdown of all this. Cause mm-hmm. With with all the entities that exist around this couch, like it would be helpful to really. Well, I mean, one thing I'll add, I guess, is like you know when you're starting a company that wants to raise capital, traditional capital, venture capital, that's when you're going to need a C corp. So a lot of people ask me, and a lot of people get caught up on this aspect of everything, right? Like I think when we did the, you know, startup episode, and we did the toilet paper. Um, <laughs> yeah. What was that? It was like the toilet paper wipes yeah. idea. Like it was just a muse for us to walk through a sort of framework. And what I said, I was like, people get overly caught up on like the the foundational steps of a startup. They spend too much time on like operating an, agreement, an operating agreement, and 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 the entity creation and the legal aspects of things. And they actually view it 
as an accomplishment and a huge deal just to set it up. And when you start to become a more seasoned entrepreneur, you just view this as just like this obstacle that you need to get out of the way as quickly as possible. So if you guys recall with like Alfalfa, it was just like, just fucking, you know, hit up my account, like set it up, Wyoming, boom, go, like LLC. And then some of us have our uh, holding company as the, as, the, as the owners of it. So you just learn to go and you learn that this is just something you need to get through. But specifically for C corporations, like if you're going to raise money from any type of investor, um, you're going to want a C corporation. And in particular, like in Silicon Valley and, you know, obviously Silicon Valley Bank and all that stuff happened. And, and the way people look at that is, is somewhat negative. But if you're going to go to any kind of fund and you're going to raise money, they require you to be specifically a Delaware C corporation. So yeah, I, think I mean, that's there, important for people. To there's know. shareholder limitations and other entity types. There's not with the C corp, which is if you want to go public, obviously you don't want any limitations on shareholder count. Mm -hmm. And then Delaware just has the best business case law. Yeah, to to reference from. Exactly. But yeah, I do agree, Eric. We could go deeper on that. Um, cool. What do you guys got? Mm. Got a mm. few things. Yeah. Good things. A yeah. Few. I'm trying to think how I should condense this. Okay. Okay. Uh, Don't I forget, first, we got to talk about dollar sign coin. Yeah, okay. you're right. I first <laughs> want to just give a shout out to the Trader Joe devs. Thank you for doubling my money in three weeks. That was very oh, beautiful. Thank you guys. Um, well, well, well played. Um, Are you going <laughs> to tell us what happened? Now, well, well, you remember I was making like the Arbit Arbitrum system plays on this like, oh, this is going to be the... What was that? Magic and... Uh, I ended up buying Magic, GMX, GMX yeah. and um, Trader Joe. And Trader Joe was like an interesting play to me because like people didn't know that they had moved over to Arbitrum. But like what's interesting about it is I, I, I kind of like reasoned my way with my brain into GMX and Magic. I was like, oh, you know, narrative, whatever. But I bought Joe because of lines on chart. Um, and like Magic ended up just being terrible. Uh, GMX broke even. But the lines on the chart... Double. So, yeah, I feel like every time I try to do fundamentals in crypto on anything less than like a seven year time, it's just it's just nonsense, honestly. So <laughs> I feel like, um, lear yeah, le learning how to chart is good. And uh, I feel like people try to reason their way through stuff. And it's just it just doesn't it just doesn't work a lot. Um, the other trade I made, which kind of ties into the alfalfa I have, is like I've been building a long arbitrum short optimism position. And uh, hmm. my old self, I used to get an idea and I'd be like, this is a good bet. I'm going to place the bet. And I would just, boom, 100% position size. I like that. <laughs> I do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't do that anymore. Um, I like that. And yeah, the other day it was a good example of it because I put on this trade. And I'm like, mm, I'm going to put on 20% of the position. I put on 20% of the position. I went long arbitrum. I went short optimism. 10 minutes later, Arbitrum nukes. Yeah. Position, <laughs> position. I would have gotten liquidated if I had put the whole position wow. on at once. But because this new me gets into positions gradually, I was able to... Over the span of two and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what I like to do now is when I want to take a position, I immediately take a position. Just even if it's very, very small, 5%, 10%, just so that... If the thing runs away from me, I don't sit there with like crippling FOMO. Oh my God, I'm such a moron. Why didn't I do that? I still do that sometimes, but like for the most part, I try to get into the thing immediately so that I have some skin in the game. It makes me watch it, right? And then there's like kind of two ways I get into the position after that. One is to, like if I have an idea of what value is, like in this instance, like I, I do, right? If you get a chance to add more at like a heavy discount, that's one way to do it. The second way to do it is to sort of just average in over time. Just be patient. It always feels like these things are gonna moon. Like the se like you you look at the chart and you're like, that's gonna moon any second. Look at look at it's just it's consolidating. It's gonna moon, and then you buy and it it, it never moons. It, <laughs> it usually dumps first. It does a liquidity run. You get wrecked, right? So you always have more time than you think to put the position on. And then the third thing you can do that is useful is you you say to yourself where's price going to go where it like confirms my idea? And even though I'm getting it at a worse price, my chance of success is greater because the position has now moved in my favor and I can kind of maybe move my invalidation up and I can kind of add more into something that's going my way as opposed to just like 
YOLOing into something which I think is in a good spot and I think it'll go up, but 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 maybe not. So Oh man, that's that's a good piece of alfalfa, but I feel like it's like such a your mileage may vary mm. because like where you and I are different investor profiles, right? Like like you are more likely to YOLO all in and all out more so than all three of us, right? So like for me, I'm I, I'm I consider myself more discerning uh, on the outset, and then what I found, this is just my personal sort of observation, is that like when I get to a place where I'm actually ready to make a trade, I've I've like I've gone through those phases that you're describing, and I will like this is previous me, I would like tiptoe in to that trade, and then I'd be like I'd see it go the way that I want, I'm like oh my god like. I should have just made the trade instead of like just sitting there watching it or tiptoeing in. And it's like, you know, I, I've been training. Like, it seems like you're training yourself to like be less of a YOLOer. <laughs> I'm training yes. myself to be more of a YOLOer because I'm, hmm. I'm like a tiptoeer naturally. Well, it depends what your horizon is. If you are scalping the 30 second chart, <laughs> then you just, you just go in. Right. Is it okay to say scalping? No, you're canceled. Well, I'm part Native American. So. <laughs> Wrong episode, but I can like, say is that. that I can say thing? that word. You can't. Is that going to be a thing next yeah. year? I don't know. <laughs> That's already a thing. Okay. It's already next thing. year. Topic for the life episode. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Cool. I, I I really enjoyed that, Stephen. I, I like that. I think your methodology makes a lot of sense to me. It's like the my favorite part of it is just like when you know that you want to participate. Get the skin in the game as quickly as possible. Yeah, I think that's the main takeaway. The, the main starter part. position. Get like your ten twenty percent in. Get the get starter in position. Get and start in. paying attention. Ooh, that and was a Nick Urbani quote from a very early episode. Hmm. What was that? I I remember it because I think we made a clip out of it. It was like, when whenever you see a trade you like, immediately get skin in the game mm. so that now you're yes. now you're playing and now your yes. attention's like now dialed your attention in is it. on it, and then you can decide how you. want I think play that's from the there. thing Druckenmiller does actually. <laughs> I think he's talking about that. As soon as it's a good idea, he just buys because he's like, worst case, markets are efficient. On average, I'll just get out at break even. Right. As soon as I realize it's not a good idea. Maybe that's not a, that's probably a good idea in hyper liquid stock, uh, like uh, equities markets. Maybe not a good idea if you're trading NFT. God, you know what I could really use right now? Just a Druck and Miller video. Just, I, <laughs> I know. Where's he been? Give I us need an him. update. Man. Let us know what, what you're thinking. Yeah, hit me up. <laughs> it's been months. In his most recent one, he said something that stood out to me. He said, like, there's no time for analysis anymore. Like, if he said, like, if one of my analysts comes to me with an idea, I have to invest right then and there. I don't have time to sit and think about it. He gets a mm. position, he, he analyzes position it, now. and then. That's crazy to me. Yeah. That's wild. Mm. Okay. Well, I feel good about that alfalfa round. So let's dig into the kind of uh, meat of this here. And I think it's a very important question. Eric, I'm going to kind of like, I, I, I'm really curious where you, where you want to start this. It's something you've been thinking about a lot. I know that it's been something you've been meaning to do a deep dive in. I'm sure that you would love to do even more of a deep dive. But it has been on your mind for a long time. And maybe you can just open this and then, of course, you know, bring it back for more nuts and bolts. But like... This question of Coinbase stock uh, versus, in particular, Ethereum, which for you, uh, one of my favorite episodes was was your four buckets uh, strategy. And then that third growth bucket, you're trying to beat the returns that you can get from Ether by holding that asset. And one of the things that you believe may be able to do this is coin stock. So like, how do we even begin to analyze this and especially with everything going on lately, how, how has that changed your sort of belief? Yeah, so this, this thesis has been developing for a long time, maybe uh, over a course of uh, six months or so. But like I've been an ETH maxi sort of by way of my portfolio, even, even if I'm not like an ETH maxi in my ideology. But you know, I just think that ETH is one of the best assets I've ever analyzed in my life, and I've been doing this for my entire adult life, right? So ETH I love. But then I was thinking like, okay, so in the next bull market, right, you want to make as much money as possible. For now, like I thought, I want to make, I want to get as much ETH as possible to, to eventually make as much money as possible. But then I, I started thinking, well, is that like the optimized way to make as much money as you can? And I, I'm starting to 
to waver here because I think coin the stock might be a better way to play the exact same narrative that ETH is playing, which would be like the prol proliferation of crypto, you know, like a, a new bull market, risk assets are zooming. And I think we, as we continue, we can get into the reasons why I think coin might be better. But, you know, as I'm starting to look at it, like ETH is the best asset I've ever seen. You know, it's like deflationary. It's like it's got these network effects. It's got new users coming in and, and they will grow further. So I love ETH, but I'm starting to think like, well, is coin even better? So while we're on this like broad view of like what's better, we're at a one trillion dollar market cap asset class roughly. I think we all think at some point we're going to hit a 10 trillion. Um, and so in, in that scenario, <laughs> that was not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> 10 yeah, trillion. Yeah. Oh, 10 man. trillion. That was not on purpose. <laughs> that was just terrible time. <laughs> Immediate. Like, no, no, 10, 10 is fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Does you're saying that it, it could be a close call between coin and, and ether when it comes to like which grows the most if we go from one trillion to ten trillion? Like let's suppose we do go to ten trillion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine that ETH is gonna be a big part of that ten trillion. Absolutely. Of course. Like what? Forty percent of it or we can bicker about it. We can wow. bicker about Whoa. Wow. We can bicker. We can bicker about <laughs> the percent of it. Twenty percent of it. We can bicker about it. Um but I'm just thinking for ETH to go to that level, whatever we think it is like, where does coin go in that same time? You know, coin has has so many tailwinds behind it that are the exact same narratives are headwinds to ETH. I'm talking regulatory. I'm talking, uh, you know, like usability, like the UX problems that Armand, I know you just went through over the weekend. Like to go on Coinbase is kind of like a dream, you know, and like they're going to continue working on UX. I don't think ETH gives a single shit about UX. <laughs> yeah. And they're, to like it, not that. to go to a billion users, like okay, so in my the short research I did on Coinbase, I, I listened to the most recent um, uh, quarterly call, right? And Brian Armstrong, CEO, he says this. He says, I'm paraphrasing, he's like, everybody uses electricity, but nobody understands how electricity works. But they like when they can flip a light switch on and their electricity works. And I think that crypto is kind of like in this point where nobody like in mainstream, understands how it works. And we do not have a light switch for them. Like we have like the engineering, like wires for people to, to use electricity, but we don't have the light switch yet. Coinbase will probably be on the forefront of like delivering the light switch to people. Help, help me understand though, like what makes it actually more valuable and what allows it to accrue more value than Ethereum? Like, can we just start, let's start to dig into that a little bit. You want to take that? Well, look, I, I think it's important to differentiate between, you can, you can have two bets, right? I could, I could offer you a bet that pays a hundred to one and the odds of it actually happening are 20 to one. That bet is massively plus EV. You make a lot of money on that bet. You make five times your money like every time you make that bet. But your risk of ruin is still very, very high. Like you still have like a 95% chance of losing that bet. So it's important to like add some nuance to the discussion. Like what has the highest chance of returning the most money for you is, does not necessarily equate to the best... Investment. Most probabilistic uh, likelihood of a positive EV. Okay. Got yeah, it. like we, we have something Eric's familiar with called like, you know, sharp ratios where we try to measure returns adjusted by risk. You know, you may be perfectly willing to take like a 5% lower return if it, if it decreases your risk of ruin by 95%. Most people would be like, yeah, it's a pretty good trade off. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to make that trade off. We're not trying to squeeze out every bit of, of, of EV. So I think it's important important to note that. So I guess like when you say that, I, I, I love this framework. When you're talking like that, do you believe, which one do you believe is a lower risk investment? Yeah. Coinbase or a crypto token like ETH, for instance? I think that uh, Coinbase has like a way higher chance of going to zero than ETH does. That's, I, that's interesting because I, I think I, that Coinbase might have a lower chance of going to zero 
and it might be higher on its like high so up. We should definitely dig into that. Yeah, let's, so let's, let's dig into that. Let's dig on into on that one, I, I do think you know Coinbase from a regulatory. I think re, let's just start off. Yeah. I think regulatory is one of the biggest risks for both Ether the asset for both right? and Coinbase. Yeah. But like there is a single point of failure for Coinbase. It is the SEC cracking down United hard States on being, Coinbase. Yeah, I think that is a single point of failure for Coinbase. Ether doesn't have a single point of failure. If Coinbase goes down, it is most certainly bad for the asset. But it, it's not the only way to purchase ETH. There, and, and, and there are international markets. Yeah, if America goes offline. Can we like America's isolate on. this and talk about this and then we move on to the yeah, next yeah, yeah. piece? Yeah, because I think like if we isolate this, like I look at that as a feather in Coinbase's cap. Like who's in the room with Congress people and with the SEC, it's like, it's Coinbase. Like, ETH is decentralized. There's nobody in the room. Like, there's nobody to talk to about ETH. Well, let's just let's talk about the Wells Notice because this is, this is part of it. Let's talk about the Wells Notice. So, so uh, I think right before we recorded last week, Coinbase got, got its Wells Notice and we we're itching to talk about it. So this is the first time we've got a chance to talk about it. Uh, the Wells Notice mentioned the spot market, which could be its retail customers. It mentioned Earn, which I believe is is, is a staking product. That's a staking is, staking product. Is Earn it, the staking product? It might be. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. thought it was. I thought they wanted to do kind of like a Gemini type thing called Coinbase Earn. M- maybe, maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong. But staking product is most definitely. I think they shut down the like yeah. the, the the just yielding or lending. Right. Yeah. Platform. They shut down the lending part. They also <laughs> mentioned Prime, which I think it's his institutional product. And then Coinbase Wallet, which is like heading into DeFi market. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Wells Notice applied to all of that. All of that. Yeah. And the consequences listed injunctive relief, which to me is the scariest. Uh, disgorgement, which is basically giving back profits. And then civil penalty is just a big old fine. Um, I look back. Ripple received its Wells Notice November 20th, 2020. So it could go on three years where there is not actually... Uh, resolution for Ripple. And Ripple is not obviously not uh, a publicly traded company, but for Coinbase to have that this potentially you know, hanging over its head of like some unknown penalty in the future. And granted, Ripple has been doing well in court, it seems like. I think people who've been following it closely think right. like the SEC should be discouraged from taking you know legal action and, and think they're going to win based upon... Uh, you know, the progress of the Ripple case. But in any case, it is this thing that, that hovers mm-hmm. over. So, so what we're know, that's the summary into, of the yeah. Wells Notice, as I understand it. Yeah, it's like what, we're, what we should dig into is like, okay, what's the worst case scenario for Coinbase? And what we're really describing, back to Eric's point, is like we're comparing this like negative risk side of the whole situation between two different assets. Um, and I think that's important to dig into. So like say say it does not lead down a good path for Coinbase. What would that look like? In, injunctive relief. So let's say uh, I think the first one to go most likely is like the staking product, mm-hmm. right? So you know it's not like Coinbase, you know, can as of today cannot unstake its ETH that it's doing on behalf of its customers. <laughs> you know they could probably come out of pocket in the meantime, and you know in a month they can unstake. Not, not a big deal. Um, but they can most certainly uh, delist assets. Probably going to be all the shit coins that that Coinbase has on there. Um, and the question is, can Coinbase at least win in court to block the injunctive relief? I think they could. You know, one one thing that bothers me about their argument is like Brian Armstrong mentions in a hey, we we've listed our business in the S one, and we said what our business is, and the SEC approved it. But in reality. The S1 lists that staking is, you know, questionable when it comes to regulatory uh, compliance. And also the SEC doesn't necessarily approve S1s. What the SEC is looking for in these processes is did you disclose everything possible for the individual investor to make a decision? They actually defer to the investor. They're not necessarily assessing risk in the S1 process. So I think that argument is, to me, falls a little flat on, uh, on its argument. Um, yeah, so I don't know. To me, that's the biggest risk is injunctive relief. Okay, but are are you saying, because we, we originally, like, Eric, I think, is the only one here who thinks that Coinbase has a lesser chance of going to zero than ETH, right? Yeah, because they so have a lot of So you're saying that, like, because there's this regulatory overhang, this is actually, like, way worse for Coinbase. You think Coinbase could go under 
as a result of the Wells notice and stuff stuff like it that's going to come on down the pike. It could be years of this kind of attack yeah. on the government. Th- th- there's a set of four judges who are going to decide whether there's injunctive relief. There's going to be the first judge who decides, and they're going to appeal, and there's going to be three judges who who get to decide if the, the appeal is worthy or, worthy or not. And that's a little scary to me. Um, yeah. And we won't know for months. Years, even. Years, okay, yeah. So, okay, I want to hear so what do you think of this argument, Eric? Like, yeah. yeah, like that the, the, there's this stranglehold well, on the entire company. Certainly regulatory. But on that yeah. asset, there's not a single point of failure. So regulatory is a risk to the entire industry. I think... I think that can be applied to ETH and Coinbase, right? What you're describing is um, the worst case scenario. Yeah. You know, I think there there is a world in which um, this Wells notice goes through legislation or, or, you know, like the judicial process. And they say, well, this thing can't exist, but like your business can. Like, I think that's probably more likely. Right. I think I think the highest likelihood is... And this is what uh, Brian Armstrong described on the, the latest earnings call, because like, they were asking about it. They said, this was before the Wells Notice was issued, but they said, hey, what about this risk of a Wells Notice? And he's like, we're very prepared for this outcome. We don't think that this would ever happen, but like, if it does, you know, we are prepared. Um, of course they're prepared. This is like right. death knell to their business. So um, in, in like a follow-up, what I saw was a, a letter that was written from Coinbase, uh, like the IR team, and it quoted a, a judge, a judge who was like ruling over uh, some ancillary but related topic. And the judge said, I'm paraphrasing, he said something like this. He's like, um, we're trying to create rules around crypto. And the CFTC is saying that they're commodities. And the SEC is saying that they're securities. And nobody can even agree on the criteria by which we would even identify what these things are. So how on earth can we start to really put any laws around this? I think by that logic, Coinbase is at really very little risk at this injunctive relief. Right. So like, I'm not worried about that. Uh, I, I do believe that there are... An, a sufficient amount of people like in Congress or whatever that, that want to see this industry thrive at this point, you know, like here's another thing I, I clipped, but I don't know. I don't have the, the quote exactly, but Brian Armstrong was like, you know, another thing we built into our app was like, uh, understanding how our leaders, how they think about crypto. And we're now giving a score to Congress people. Wait, this is happening? Yeah, yeah. It's built into the this Coinbase is, this app. Is, this is, is, it? This is Nick's This is Nick's oh, yeah. vision. This is Nick's dream. So it's in Coinbase, the app, where it lists all Congress people and they're a score on how they rate crypto. He's like... Oh, you, damn, like, you don't get to start that business. <laughs> Thank uh, God. He's like... Yeah. <laughs> he said, like, we have so many users. Like, we're, at, you know, in America, I think it's like one in five households have touched crypto mm-hmm. to a point where it's like a very powerful mm-hmm. lobby. You know, it, it gets it gets to Congress now mm-hmm. where I think they're incentivized to, you know, try to be accommodating. Yep. And I don't I don't see a world in which they just squash the leader globally that happens to be American based. Mm-hmm. So for me, the risk is so low. Like this this seems Okay, but I, I, I still need to I still need to see a compelling scenario where ETH is zero but Coinbase exists. That's the thing I'm not Well, I don't think either of them getting. I don't think either of them go to zero. But like imagine that crypto uh, gets squeezed in such a way like in in tr- like in coins, we have crypt- we have crypto regis- uh, legislation risk, right? We we have risk where they can squeeze the off ramps or the on ramps. They can squeeze our ability to use a blockchain. They can, well, maybe not. Like once you're on a blockchain, they can't squeeze that. But they can definitely squeeze your ability to access a blockchain. Mm-hmm. If you're a stock, I, I don't think that they want to squeeze that away. Like I don't think that you need to be on a blockchain to trade in Coinbase. So you can literally swap coins. You can 
You can trade stuff on Coinbase without actually accessing a blockchain. But if you shut down your access to ETH, that really, like in the United States, that would really limit the use case of ETH. Right. But ETH isn't going to zero if that happens. Not zero. Not no. zero. I mean, it would be, it'd still be a global asset. Yeah. But like, and like, what, how does, like Coinbase has like really tied themselves to ETH at this point. They're building a L2 on ETH. Like the wallet as a service is like a very heavily of course. And, and ETH forward thing. You so know? hold on. Like I think we're, we're talking about something that I actually believe in, which is like, I believe in both these assets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these things are correlated highly. So I think a good way to, it was a good way to start a discussion is like, is one more at risk than the other? <laughs> And does if it, do yeah. any of you have a strong opinion on I, that? I like, have an extremely strong opinion. Yeah. I like I would I would guess the risk of Coinbase effectively going to zero before ETH is probably like a factor of like ten or twenty. Like I like I feel like it's not even close. Like because ETH is like it's a mutable code written in a decentralized way across the world. It's but it's not just code too. It's this whole like network of people. There's a social layer. There's all this stuff, right? And then. Coinbase is just this kind of comparatively tiny little U.S. company. And I think it's also important to note, it's not... So there is an argument to be made that Coinbase is going to benefit from some sort of regulatory capture, right? But I think that knife cuts both ways. Like, they could also mean that, like, what if the plan is to get J.P. Morgan and Fidelity and all the trad people into crypto, right? And they all suddenly, like, Coinbase isn't the only kid playing in the swimming pool anymore, now they're competing against all these guys. And now um, JP Morgan's just like, whatever, you can trade Bitcoin for free because we're going to do other stuff with like the, like I could see that competition sort of like weighing on them a little bit. Now I will say that I, and maybe we can pivot to this topic too, because I think it's interesting. I think when I look at this, I see a bunch of analysts analyzing coin, right? And they're all coming at it from a traditional Wall Street perspective. Oh, the earnings, this and that. Look, like, one thing we know in crypto is that all this stuff is just like hyper reflexive to the point where you can't like even make projections on stuff. It's just like, like uh, users beget more price begets users begets revenue, and then the opposite happens, and it all goes to zero, and it all goes back up. It's it's kind of like worthless. It, it it all reminds me a little bit of like Tesla when analysts were analyzing that. Tesla back in the day, and they were just like. This company doesn't make money. There's only X amount of uh, lithium in the world, and they would have they would just like make all these sort of like very left-brained arguments for why oh Ford is worth it. They're worth more than blah blah blah. I almost feel like it doesn't matter because I I think that if if Coin has value, it's not as like a traditional business that like it's not as a traditional exchange that kind of makes fees. I think that goes away. I think it's going to be something that doesn't exist in the world today. It's going to be a business model that doesn't currently exist. They're going to be doing something interesting, either with like the layer twos or the wallet of the service or something else. And so I feel like it's a bit weird to try to like strap on these kind of discounted cash flow analyses onto it. What do you I, think? I totally agree. I think what you're leading to is like a, a better discussion. Let's ungovern the discussion. Yeah. We were talking about the risk side alone, mm -hmm. right? Let, yep. Let's talk about the risk and the return side. You know, like Coinbase can become this Tesla-like organism that just like serves all of crypto and it, it, and it is the only so this one is my, that is this like is anointed. My question. It's like when you don't have clear fundamentals to measure the value of a company like Coinbase because there's this like correlation to how a company like Tesla's stock price was really like how the market looked at it. You look at that and it's kind of a bit of like a gray box. And then you look at ETH, the entire ecosystem as a whole and ETH are the asset. And it's, it's been this, like, as Steven said, very reflexive sort of uh, journey that it's been on. How do you then even begin to identify what has the higher reward long term. One is this infrastructure ecosystem that is, you know, Web3 as a whole and NFTs and like we're building the new internet on it. And the other is this on and off ramp and exchange that is like super valuable that houses all of these different tokens and has all of these different features, but also has all these 
different aspects to it that we don't even know like what they're going to introduce in the future that will accumulate value and revenue for the company. So it's like you can't even predict what Coinbase is going to create, whether it's an NFT marketplace or whatever it might be in the future that just brings in a ton of revenue or a ton of users. And on the one hand, like Coinbase could be more responsible for user adoption than Ethereum ever is. So it's like, which one in the end is going to reap the rewards more than the other? Is there any way to even begin to like analyze this? Because like, I feel like, I feel, I feel like you, you're you saying like, it's this, Coinbase. This, oh, this is like, the- Let's get to the fucking meat. I think that's the fundamental question. So I, um, I think you brought up great points. And that's the fundamental question. When we're talking about uh, 15, 20 years from now, I, I don't think- that anything can get bigger than ETH, right? Because ETH, if ETH go, becomes like this big settlement layer for like many different roll-up blockchains and Coinbase is even one of them, you know, like it all comes back to ETH eventually. But what I'm really playing for is not 20 years from now. I'm trying to play for the next bull cycle. Right. Okay, good point. So like, what about five years from now? Five years from now, are you going to be better served holding dollar sign coin or holding ETH, and I always thought it was ETH, and now I'm like on yeah. the side where it's like I think Coin outperforms. It's interesting. I'm, I don't know if any of you guys looked at the the beta, but as you guys were talking, I was just looking up year to date since January one. Today is uh, March 29th. You know, Bitcoin's up 75 percent. Looks like ETH's up like roughly 40 percent ish. Uh, Coin's doubled. Coin's up 100 percent since year to date. So it has had high beta in this scenario. Um, but in terms of like what impacts price, I was trying to find some numbers. I did find one article that did try to do a pretty honest try at this. But um, it seems like the thing that moves coin price the most is asset, Bitcoin asset price, right? So it looks like the correlations have ranged from 0.44 to 0.9, which even I'd say 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5 is a, is a relatively strong uh, sorry, correlation. correlation to Bitcoin price. Correct. Yeah. Um, it, in the Q3, Q4, 2022, it had like a 0. 0.6 correlation. What's interesting though, and this may bring up the point that it's a pretty high beta, maybe to, to your argument for a bull run, but also during the June sell-off, it had a 0. 0.9 correlation, like a very mm. high yeah. correlated to, to Bitcoin price. So is it, I mean, we're, we're talking about these different angles, but is it really just simple? Like it's correlated to I, asset I price and that's it? I think we're make, we're also like making this a little too complicated as well. Like to do a 10X in ETH, Ethereum has to go to like a $2 trillion valuation. To do 10X in coin, it has to go to like $150 billion valuation. Which it already was. Which it already was, right? So... Mm. That's Ooh. the what, that's the, the main that I forgot reason. That one. Yeah, didn't like, it IPO at like two hundred fifty dollars? Uh, yes. Yeah, it up, <laughs> no, it, it was more because I I bought like four hundred bucks. <laughs> well, it oh, IPO'd at two fifty, but then it traded up to four twenty five on the first day of okay. trading. Yeah, like it just has to hit. Which like, was a what market cap? Uh, hundred million plus. Oh, sorry, hundred billion. billion plus. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. So, so, so that's the main thing. You're you're investing in something that is a smaller market cap. So. It, it's going to go up way more on average, all well, things being equal on the way smaller up. Smaller market then, cap and smart, smaller relative market cap to its all-time high. That's what you're pointing yes, at, right? Like, yes. Like if it if it just goes to its all-time high, you, from here you do like a you 7X, won. which is probably more than you could hope for Versus from like ETH. Versus like your best case scenario yeah. of a 2.5X. I think there's like, of, I think there's a, uh, you know, going back to the risk conversation, we, I don't want to like go back to the risk conversation, but like when you talk about risk with ETH, like there's a bunch of Bitcoiners out there that fucking hate ETH, but like Coinbase can still exist and thrive in like a scenario where any chain wins. Mm -hmm. Because Coinbase is a service provider to plebs, regardless of who wins I do the blockchain love that. wars. Except I do there's love like that. no services on Bitcoin. So Agreed. they're really hoping. Yeah, but like Bitcoiners, <laughs> Bitcoiners also believe that there's going to be services built on Bitcoin based on Lightning or whatever. Like and I'm not so a Bitcoiner. Does, so do Solana people. Yeah, and, so, but know, like Cardano people. And, Coinbase can serve yeah. all these. Right. Yes, that is right. a big plus in Coinbase's corner is that they can kind of be agnostic they're to agnostic. the winner of crypto. Yeah. Even though they also do, I think, have a much higher risk of ruin in their 
favor, they do have this ability so to let, be. Can we can we flexible. put some numbers to that? Because I I actually think that it's important. Like because when you're talking about the risk of ruin of ETH, I want you to say like what's the what percentage would you say that ETH goes to zero? You might say zero. Like what's the percentage, and then what's the percentage of Coinbase going to zero? You might say. One yeah. percent. Well, like zero is not, not going to happen, but I think a better number might be like, what's the odds that ETH is like negative 95 percent in 10 years? I don't know. The chances that are, I would guess they're like 10 or 15 percent. OK, something like that. And then what's Coinbase? You, you said it was an I think order Coinbase of magnitude is a, higher. I think Coinbase is. Yeah, I, I think they're over 50 percent to be zero in 10 years. Over 50 percent. Yeah, I think it's a risky Risky fucking endeavor over a decade. A lot of companies go bankrupt. This is a company first mover in like the most risky industry. There's no reason that they are, are going to be at the it one. The way you looked at look at like any of these other exchanges is that why like and they all just like came and went. So well, I just think gone gone my baseline is like that FTX over a ten year or? time horizon, a lot of companies fail as yeah. a baseline. Nick probably yeah. knows what the exact number is because he's an algo, but like it's <laughs> a pretty. It's a pretty high number, right? Yeah. And then if we adjust that for crypto, it goes it's way up. Higher. And then the yeah. other thing is like, although Coinbase, I believe, is making good moves now, historically, they've been pretty shit, in my opinion, at actually executing stuff. Does Coinbase have time on its side between the next bull market that you want to capture all of this in versus the regulatory risk and everything that is coming with the world's no. notice. No, it doesn't it does because not. it's losing it's losing right. cash. Yeah. That's the only thing that like it needs to survive this cash burn. I think in like trailing 12 months, you know, over 3 billion in rev, over 2 billion in losses, those are gap losses, so like the, that, that's not actually negative cash flow 2 and a half billion. Um so it, it is obviously losing money until transaction volume really starts peaking again and asset prices go up again. Um, can, I, can I mention one thing we mentioned previously? Uh, we, we talked about the relative market cap and relative to all-time highs, because that, that's a pretty good argument. Like, yeah. I think that's probably one of the better arguments for coin in terms of like where could it go and where has it already been? I wanted to ask, do you feel that there is a little bit of a rug pull? Because they did last year in 2022, they did 1.75 billion in stock-based compensation. It's basically mm. like a gentle rug, huh. which was it was fifty percent of revenue. A slow rug. I don't know what it is of like total market cap. I mean, I'm sure we calculated, it, but it's like one point seven on seventeen, like ten percent. It's a slow rug. Uh, I agree. Do, does that bother you at all, or are you just like, eh? I, I'm not. Uh, I'm fairly nonplussed, but like it is, it is a slow rug. Like the, that rug exists in most crypto tokens. Like Solana is uh, inflating at a higher percentage than that. Right. Um, it doesn't exist in ETH. It doesn't exist in ETH. Bitcoin is lower than 5% right. inflation, but, you know, it is still inflating. Um, you know, that's something that they're concerned about. That was like one of the first things they mentioned on their, their call. Oh, they did? Yeah. I mean, they mentioned the, the two first things they talked about was like, we're going to reduce our burn rate, try to get to like adjusted EBITDA positive as quickly as possible, and we're going to work on the dilution. And, and I, I think it's probably easy for them to, you know, work on the dilution. Like, you know, in a bull run, you're competing for talent. And that's usually where the stock-based compensation goes. So, like... It's engineers. Yeah, exactly. They're less likely to compete for talent in a bear market. It's probably going to be easier to really pare back that So, in the short term, it spikes because you got to lay off a bunch of people. And then those people need to get paid out immediately via severance or whatever. So, you'll see a spike in the short term. But then, longer term, they're talking about... Uh, like a 35% reduction in headcount and bringing that uh, stock-based compensation down 50%. Okay. So it's something there, like that type of talk is exactly what I want to see from management because it's like what I'm worried about. So yeah. if and they're worried about it, I'm, I'm feeling good I even think that. with like a 5 to 10% you know, inflationary rug as a shareholder, your argument still holds that like, well, you look like where they've already been as, in terms of total market cap. And, you know, where ETH has been, like, that there is, like, a, a potentially better return if we just, each asset class goes back to its all-time high. So, um, I want to go back one step, because going back one step is, like, we were talking about Coinbase failing. Mm -hmm. And here is, like, where um, fundamental analysis actually comes into play. Like, 
Stephen hates it, but like this is this is where fundamental analysis matters. It's like you are looking at how much cash a company can bring in versus how much it burns versus how much it has in its bank accounts. Mm -hmm. So it's got four billion in its bank account. They're reducing its cash burn to a to a place where like they're saying they're going to be break even by the they're even calling by the end of 2023. Oh wow. But I think that's ambitious. Like let's call it the end of 2024. At that point, like at some point, transaction revenue is going to kick up again. Yep. Right? So here's another thing that I noticed is that transaction revenue down, but services revenue up. Yeah, I want to talk about that because it's kinda of, it's kind of funny. It, it, that's a weird thing to have happen, right? Like mm. the services revenue is recurring, but it's also uh, a little hollow. It's also the net interest margin they're making off the treasuries from USDC. People. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Like mm. the, the predominant revenue stream on their recurring revenue or on their services revenue is basically interest on USDC. Hmm. Um, but, you know, take that while it's good. It, yeah. Right, take it, it while it's good. But it's just funny that, like, in order for the price to go up, you probably need yields to go down and their second biggest revenue source likely needs to go down in order for but like we're the talking about we're talking about fundamentals in terms of survival like can they right. survive uh this downturn i think absolutely you know they have this huge cash worth four billion dollars their burn <laughs> is decreasing they're going to be fine you know their bonds are priced for failure i've been an investor in their bonds like i i love coinbase bonds 14% like yield to maturity. I'll take that all day. Um, I, I, I don't think there are any risk of failure, like 50% that Steve is describing. Okay. Well, I can agree to disagree on that. Do we want to keep this going for a while? I've been trying to like not die, but I am, I have never had to pee so badly in my life. You can just so, pee now. So I, I thought about just going in my uh, pants actually, but <laughs> I think we're going to need a we're gonna need a breather. Would for, you do that for the pod? I, I thought about it. I, you for know, I've, culture, I've bro. never interrupted an episode midway. I, to, I would be like, willing to turn Alpha, this into Alpha a now I am in physical. I, I am in by, physical pain. I by Johnson this, and Johnson I'm in physical pain. I think that could be our first <laughs> NFT. Like <laughs> when Steven. No, just you have go. stopped in when the middle of an episode. Steven no, 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 no. I have never. No, you've done. You've done it before. I hope you don't forget the code of the bathroom. No, I did do it. I think you should go to the bathroom. And we yeah five two one and 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 we'll be here when you get back. Yeah, We're idea. just gonna keep going. Oh my God. Um, five two one. Yeah. <laughs> so, Giorgio, keep all this in. Yeah, please, just, please keep, keep this. Just in. keep it going. So <laughs> he was like, "Can we pause? We're not pausing." So. Um, Look, like ultimately what we're talking about here is, uh, well, well, we're talking about a lot of like very specific things and we got into the nitty gritty, like which I wanted. I, I, I appreciate it. But it that. might be too much. It's okay. Let's zoom back out. Yeah. So where we're at is like, in summary, at least lately, like you're really strong against this idea of like a 50% plus failure rate. I mean, how does that stand for you? But I, but, well... But I think to, to Stephen's like defense, he was talking about absolutely, like in general, and you're referring to like accumulating value over this next bull run. So, and then my question previous to that was like, we have this regulatory risk coming, is time on their side between now and then? And then Eric, you argued that yes, they're fine. They're going for a positive EBITDA, they have enough cash in the bank, and everything's going to work out. And then we have transaction volume increasing just exactly when we need it to just in time and everything's going to work out. Yeah, Do I mean, you agree like, with that? Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. Like if you and I are running that business, we'd be like, we need to get to cash flow break even as fast as possible. Right. We need to buy time because we're going to need a war chest to, to go to battle. Yeah. So let me, let me just like massage what you just said a little bit. Transaction volume has gone down, right? Like as crypto. First of all, who's transacting? So Yeah. <laughs> Crypto has gone down, and that means interest has gone down, means transaction volume has gone down. But interestingly enough, uh, their market share has risen pretty significantly. So like the people who do trade obviously aren't trading on FTX anymore or other competitors. They're trading on Coinbase, yep. and Coinbase is, uh, is sort of the anointed preferred uh, exchange to use if yeah. you're, you're going to like be a, a trader. Yeah, if Balaji is right, everyone's going to go to Coinbase to buy uh, Bitcoin, but they won't know how to get it off Bitcoin. So I think uh, like of Coinbase anyway. So yeah, yeah. I gotta my my critique of Stephen's fifty percent is that like 
these things are so correlated, ETH and Coinbase. They're so correlated right now that like you're not going to see a failure of one without like a, a brutal decimation of another. Yeah. So it's like if you're going to invest in in them, pick, pick the best. Pick the one that's going to fly when it flies. Okay, but and why? If it dies, I don't then think. Both I die. don't think we've gone into why it's going to fly more than ETH. Like, okay. like, like, let's can, like, like we're working I mean, I, our I way he, I think he made. into 2025, the peak of the bull market. Why has coin returned more than ETH? Okay, so let's get a little more intricate with why it could fly. Okay, yeah. and I'm not saying it will. I'm just saying it could, right? And I don't know. ETH will fly, but I, I'm. I, yeah. What are the variables here? What are the aspects that so we're looking ultimately at? all you need is the proliferation of participants in the crypto sphere, the entire and, ecosystem. And like, okay. what that means is like basically everybody coming onto Ethereum because like Coinbase is sort of like tethered themselves to that horse. Okay. So like, I'm a believer in ETH. Like, I I own way more ETH than I own Coinbase. This exercise to me is to try to help me like see the light that Coinbase is going to fly higher because I actually think it will. So I, what I see now is like Coinbase has the users, like the users that Ethereum doesn't have. Like nobody's touching the blockchain. You just had this experience over the weekend where you're like frustrated because this shit is not intuitive. It is fucking disgraceful. I don't even want to talk about like, it. Yeah, it's so bad. It's so bad that it's not worth talking it's about. It's so bad that like, how does this thing even exist yeah. with a billion users? It doesn't. It doesn't. And my point is... No fucking way. So... No fucking way. Zero. Zero like, percent chance Ethereum... That's why Big Dick Boy in our <laughs> Discord community talks about there just being like 200,000 people in, excuse me, but like one perpetual circle jerk. Like, yes. I don't know if those were his exact words. Uh, you're welcome, Big Dick Boy. Like, I made it even yeah. better. He got but, a shout out before yeah. so many goats. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even know what this podcast <laughs> is. Never he doesn't even listen to this podcast. <laughs> He's got some great takes, though. Um, <laughs> but, like, yeah, it's like this 200,000 person, you know, circle jerk. And right. it's like, it's never going to go beyond that it's literally if us, we don't solve this us problem. Us for giving our money yeah. to Steven, him yeah. giving it back. <laughs> exactly. So, to uh, access more users it takes sort of like this web two to web three transitioner transition or mm -hmm. which i think coinbase is going to be like who else is taking that torch i think you're right like robin hood so is saying robin they're going that, to. that yeah. could have been said of like netscape when the internet or aol when the internet was happening like it's still so early so are you saying like google has just not been born yet like coinbase could High be probability Al alta vista there is going to be like a tremendous financial incentive to innovate in this space if what we think is going to happen to this space happens and coinbase is going to have like competition left and right now i agree i, will I say agree for but next i don't cycle, think i like, don't think that's the problem happen, with netscape right? navigator and alta vista and all these was that they weren't good. Like my biggest they complaint. Good. Like my biggest fear <laughs> I mean, is Coinbase that isn't good. I would argue is. Coinbase so is good. My biggest for fear what it does. is that like, Ethereum is the Netscape, mm. and that Coinbase yeah. can thrive under any chain. Yeah, I, I I still think your your best arguments for for Coinbase running faster than ETH is, well, the beta has been higher at least in in this little small period. It'd be interesting to analyze it over a longer period of time, but that. Relative market cap, relative value, still, you know, provides like right. And, a, a and good like if I if I take your uh, statement to be true, higher beta, but then I also conflict with Steven's statement, which is I don't think it's a fifty percent of failure within the next five years. Ten. No, I know that was your that was your statement, but I'm gonna I'm gonna shorten it to the, to five because I I believe no, that's where not the fifty percent five. But that's my that's my idea of the next bull cycle, right? that a bull cycle will resume in five years, then I think your game theory optimized to invest in coin, not ETH. What yeah, I mean, think, Fidelity's Nick? got, got going to be a, a um, an entrant, or is an entrant sure, now. If you buy Fidelity, you're buying, like they're, yeah. it's like a tiny not a piece pure of play. what they do. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, my my where I fall in all of this is I still want to hold ETH. I do want to hold coin, but I do think like it's good to hold spot ETH but coin is a better derivatives and options market. Like there is a very liquid and deep 
uh, options market leap for calls, coin, leap calls exactly. Um, and if it is oh, a little okay. higher, hold on, hold on. Okay, All right. uh, d- d- explain it like for the for the eight year olds here. Okay, please. we're we're in March 2023. A leap would be you know betting on the March 2024 calls, for okay. example. And you you probably go uh, to 2026 maybe. It's a call option that's five. like, or it's an option that's you're, you're I think generally like a year or more right. in duration. You're skipping. Okay. Yeah, in which you don't have that with ETH. Like, so, like, imagine imagine that you make a, this bet, right? You make a bet that coin stock is going to be over $100 by March of 2026, for instance. And you only have to pay, you know, like $100 for that or something. Like, you just play that over and over again. You risk, you know, 10 options contracts. And then if it doesn't go, who cares? You and and it's liquid. Bucks. Like, you, you'll be able to sell it. You know, like but if, the it time does, comes, but if it does go to all time highs, it's like you profit. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think I've learned this from both you and Steven that like options, especially some of those like leap, you know, those long dated options, they're more play on price volatility than it is the actual price. I mean, I don't know, maybe as you get longer dated out, you're actually playing the price. But um, if, if Coinbase is going to be higher beta when it does, you know, it, this it, is it, the way you'd like to play it. Yeah. I think like you, I would, I would love to buy call like deep liquidity, long dated calls on, on options at like a cheap price, but there's just no market Mm -hmm. to do that. But like coin is a great way to, to implement that, that form of a, of a trade. So like, Uh, you got me thinking too, cause, um, I, I do this on ETH on the sell side. So like I sell monthly ETH calls. So I I was selling monthly ETH three thousands and getting good bids on that. Hmm. Like I could take the longer dated coin, mm-hmm. sell ETH mm-hmm. calls, and like if if ETH goes to three thousand, coins going higher too. So yeah, right. So I don't know. I think I like like holding it as much ETH as I can, and then probably hold some like longer dated as probably long as possible. How um, correlated are coin and Bitcoin? Like uh, I said, a range of 0.4 and. Point nine, oh, yeah. so like moderately correlated to Moderate. very highly correlated yeah, in these that's, dumps. That's pretty highly correlated, to be honest. Yeah, like I think like a weak correlation is like, you know, point three, point two, point one. Right, because that's still positive correlation. Or, yeah, I guess any anything from negative point three to plus point three is yeah. Whether inversely or side question, is this going to be the the ETH uh, the sort of uh, bull cycle where it sort of becomes the big daddy, or still not yet? Doesn't doesn't seem to be in these war times uh, right. indicative well, of there's, that. Well, there's an important thing that is also kind of like a, you know, duh, like yeah. middle or left curve, I, I would say, like <laughs> thesis here, which is that coin was literally launched at the exact top of the last bull run. Mm-hmm. It was quite literally like the top. Yeah. Right. So it's never had its own sort of like bull run to shine. This happens a lot with coins where they sort of launch at the end and then they never do anything and then they get beat to hell and the next cycle they're able to kind of come back and really, really shine. The, the, the other side of that argument is that when that happens, you do have a lot of people who are badly underwater mm-hmm. who want to unload their bags, right? And there's sort of this like wall that you have to get through to go to Valhalla, which isn't great, but... This is just the best way for like any institution that can't literally hold or custody coins to get exposure to crypto right now in a world without a Bitcoin ETF, mm-hmm. right? So I feel like for that reason alone, it's got to look super attractive. And if some of these like clouds get lifted Why off, are of there us, not more funds picking it up then? You know, because there's like, too much there's too much scary shit going on right now. Yeah. Scary shit with crypto, yeah, no and then there's doing anything. And, and Coinbase itself like has the regulatory stuff which we talked about. Yeah. Their bond is literally trading at like fifty eight cents on the dollar. I mean, that's it's great buy. Extreme. It's a junk bond. It's a great buy. It's it is it is technically like you, a junk th- bond. I think that's an interesting question. Like, should you buy the equity or should you buy the bond? Well, I'm balls deep in the bond. But wait, uh, what what are the uh, you, maturities like? How how long? Twenty eight and thirty one, I think. Yeah. Oh, so I'm in the twenty twenty eight bond. But like, if we resume bull market your bond goes to par so you get uh you know like a 60 percent return on the bond value and maybe 40 percent 40 percent yeah sorry plus 40. uh 3.3 percent on the bond coupon Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. uh yeah so i i like the bond because i i just i'm a believer that this company is not going under in the next five years um and steven wasn't saying that either uh, right right you said 10 years uh 
but I, I'm also thinking about it this way. So, um, Coinbase, Coinbase is, uh, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> well, can I, can I bring up a point uh, about line, like a, <laughs> line, give me my line. Um, uh, Steven, you mentioned, you know, initially when the stock came out, what was it, like 300 something, 350, somewhere around there? Mm-hmm. Um, you could argue that it's kind of like the price discovery phase of like when a token launches, like Arbitrum started off like $8. And so when going back to our argument that, you know, comparing ETH and coin where it is now to its all time high, you kind of like, that's a, that's a con against that argument because maybe mm-hmm. we're just in like price discovery mode and okay, it's not a good that. reference point for I anything. got it back. I got it back. So I was going Welcome into back. fundamental analysis. So the idea is like Coinbase is a security, right? Like this is a bona fide security. This is a Real deal. equity component. Like you're, you own a piece of a business. You have access to their cash flows, right? So Coinbase has negative cash flows today. The, the immense value that we place on Coinbase, the stock, which is like at you know, $15 billion today, is all about its future prospects, but it, it wasn't even that long ago. It was like at the bull market peak uh, a year and a half ago or whatever, two years ago, mm-hmm. that they had, man, I don't even remember the numbers. It was like $6 billion in earnings, $6 billion in earnings to support this valuation. Obviously, these are like hyper cyclical, but like when this company comes back, it's going to come roaring back. If it does. So like, you know, you can even like look at sales instead. Like I think they're trading like 1.2 times sale, like something really, really low. Mm. You know, their, their sales number is going to be sort of muted by transaction volume being low services, volume increasing over time, you know, like services, their, their long-term play is to not be an exchange. Like they don't want to, they don't want to thrive on, trading yeah. revenue because that all sort of trends down to zero. This is like a commodity game, like a commoditized game where like, mm-hmm. you know, the lowest price wins. So they don't even want to play that game. They want to be like the anointed one where they, they sort of do other things custodial. They do like, I, I can imagine them getting in with BlackRock where they do like, Wait, what's the main thing they want to do? Like, what do they want to do? I think they want to be in everything. I think they want to be in wallets. I think they want to be in 401k programs. I think they want to be in like... Like we're talking more like bringing TradFi to... Yeah, yeah, like okay, the, that DeFi. bridge. Yeah. And, and do they want to do DeFi? Is that even... I think, the- they would, I think they would like to do DeFi. So here's another thing they talked about was um, uh, on the earnings call, they said... Would that even make sense? Somebody asked huh. like, would you guys ever want to do stocks like Robinhood? And they said... That's not currently on our radar, but what we would be very interested in is if we could wrap traditional securities into sort of on-chain securities and then, mm. you know, be yeah. the exchange for that. Yeah. He's, they said, obviously, there's no sort of hospitable <laughs> regulatory environment for that. But, you know, if that b- does come to pass, like imagine the like the yeah. volume that goes for that. Like, Isn't on, that kind of like... Sorry, isn't that kind of like a DeFi thing in a way, like a synthetics kind of thing in a way? Absolutely. Like, imagine if it? they like, if, imagine not, if they just swallow. Not super DeFi if you're wrapping not, a security. No, but know? like you're giving exposure to these things. Uh, like, that would pretty just, cool. I mean, it's pretty cool. It would enable twenty four seven trading. It would, yeah, like, that it's, would really it's cool for a different way. It know? would really unlock a lot of value. I think so. Interesting. I, I believe that they're. Forward looking, and they're and that guidance well, get, looking forward look, is very through, valuable. They have to get through a, you know, difficult, uh, difficult period. I think I like that it's so, sort of like uh, the risk risk is high right now, and I I, I want to see a little bit more, uh, sort of like this shit is a bad buy, and for more analysts to go like don't touch this. Yeah. I think that's in the forties. Range Mark, for me. Uh, Mark Cahotas is coming I out. I just made that up now. as if I'm like that? a very yeah, technical. Ma- Mark Cahotas is a big, uh, big, sh- sh- big, big short, short seller. seller. He Alder Lane Eggs is that his thing? Yeah, yeah. Something? On Twitter, on Twitter? Alder, Alder Eggs Alder, or something. Alder Lane eggs yeah, or I'm something? a 47 right so, now. So Eric, can you give? Can you answer two questions? What's your like price target when you would start buying? And also, just looked up the uh, March 2025 
$170 strike price, $13 call option. $13 option. You like that? And no, I don't like, uh, answer your second question first. I don't like that. I think I want to see spot price bleed out. So like I am a no dollar sign coiner, like I said. I want to see this thing die first. You don't want to see 47? You don't like 47? Uh, I think it tests all time lows is what I want to see. And, uh, you know, like we've been talking about macro, like we're going to get into a place where people are, I, here's my supposition. We get into a place where people are asking, why did I ever buy any type of risk asset? And like coin is one of the riskiest of the risk assets. And, you know, when you just bleed that out, like that's when I want to swoop and I want to mm. back up the truck. I like that thesis. Insiders, we're we're, we're insiders. so far removed from like a period where people are like just so disgusted with something. Like, like there was a point in time where people were so disgusted with stocks, right? That nobody wanted to touch a stock. Like nobody in the country wanted to touch a stock. We're not even close to that yet. Like people are still what happily buying. I think what people if it's different still believe. I yeah, think people like, believe that there's still like a bull market. Like tomorrow, yeah, they do. They do. Um, it's like right around the corner tomorrow. The uh, the guy that runs the Daily Guay, Sasano. Sasano. I actually, I, sorry, you know, daddy brain. Um, met met him briefly at East Denver as well. Great guy. He he tweeted something like just yesterday saying, like this might have been it. Like maybe this cycle, like that's as bad as it gets. Like, oh, that's lovely. exactly that's what lovely. I like to hear. That's lovely. You like that? That's so lovely. Yeah. I feel like no. he's, I mean, I feel this like is, he's this is trying to like nuke it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like trying can, to nuke it. Now my short uh, spidey senses are coming activated. So you don't believe in this sort of idea of a, of a spiral loop that um, while it appears to be extremely volatile uh, in the short term, in the long run, it's actually on an upward exponential curve? No, I actually do believe that. But so then why wouldn't your lows be less painful in this cycle than Do you previously. feel like you've really experienced pain this cycle? No, but that's the question I'm asking. You know? I'm asking if but the lows But you're talking about a spiral pain, and like where are we on the We are the we spiral? have not like, hit like a fraction of what it felt like to go to like $80 each the bottom of the spiral be higher than the previous bottom of the previous yes, spiral. Yes, maybe like, 2008. We're at, like like think about that. Like, yeah, that would be. I, there was no blood. point in time in this cycle where people were like, uh, "I think ETH is dead." Like, there's no point in time in this cycle. Everybody's just like, "Yep, but yeah, what, I don't know." Bear market is that like, like going I don't to be a thing? Yeah, I don't think time. we go lower than our 2008 lows. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, I think uh, people have. I think this group of of crypto bull cycle, the 2020 you know, a uh, quick panic and then in massive QE inflection and then literally everything roared back is too close in their heads. Yeah. And that's just not how it works out most of the time. And I think this is going to be one of those cases that when the Fed does pivot and this they haven't yet, but when they do, like we talked about, I think two or three episodes ago, like when they do pivot, the market doesn't bottom immediately because something is mm -hmm. fucked up when they, when they typically pivot and so i think everyone has this 2020 reference in their head yeah that when pivot Just everything's going to moon and that is not going to be the case and that is when pain is going to happen people actually start losing their jobs every, everybody's still thinking about it too right like bull markets bottom when nobody's sitting around asking about the fed asking about the pivot like everybody's so disgusted they've long since thrown everything in the garbage walked away taken up a new career mm -hmm. right the mere fact that everybody is still watching it like waiting on like the edge of their seat for a pivot like just means that like it just feels like the actual bear isn't over not yet. enough not enough apathy so for like you. what yeah. was uh yeah what was 2020 lows that was like s p 2900 like I, sounds about right i think we go i think we go below that like imagine if if what you're Wait. describing <laughs> is this like loop that just doesn't go below the previous low, which yeah. is in 2008. Yeah, I'm imagining this, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But imagine that, but like... 20, 2,600 was the 2600. low. 2,600. 2,584. And like everybody's tethered to this like 3,600 number in the S&P. Like 3,200 happens, 2,900 happens. Like what's coin doing at that point? Fucking death. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and at that point, that's when I back up the truck. Stephen, are you satiated? 
Am I satiated? I think it's just a very important thing before we wrap here. Um, yeah, I feel I feel good. I, I mean, look, I, I'm a, I'm a talker. I could always keep talking, but yeah. I'll. Like, are you satiated? Yeah, I feel I feel good. I'll keep some things like, uh, to myself. I brought up new stuff that I hadn't thought about before. I think oh, I still I kind of fall in the same place, but like, yeah, I feel good. I, I feel like I'm not satiated until I hear what everyone else. I mean, we're four people here. We're trying to parse through some messy grace stuff to make a decision on investing in an asset that could reap incredible rewards in the next bull market. So I, I, I personally am very curious what the community thinks. Um, I think, um, Jordan, if you can, throw a poll on the Spotify and we should ask people to comment, you know, on the YouTube or in the Discord, like what they think. Is it coin or is it is it will, ETH? Will coin out will coin outperform ETH? ETH yeah. over the next five I'd be years. Very, I'd be very curious. And like, when I, when I, I, I appreciate that caveat as well, like over the next five years, yeah, yeah, the next... Because over the next cycle. hundred years, ETH is going to grow so much bigger than Coinbase. Sure, but yeah, uh, I agree. So normally, when I get like really into this shit, I'll, I'll like build a valuation model and I'll 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 tell you guys at the point in which I'm buying coin, and I, I'm just not there yet because I haven't I haven't done it. But well, we're gonna find out. Yeah, I'm gonna know when you go. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get there. All right, I like it. Let us know. Let us know your thoughts. Throw it in the uh, YouTube comments below. Let us know in the Discord. And uh, we'll see you next time. Peace. Bye. Peace. Peace.